Part two wants to talk, talk about some operation and space station and operating mode approaches. I think some of you that we worked with before, some of this is not new information but for re, again for review. Like, of course, we'd like to be safe first and, and be compliant and get the job done and hopefully keep costs down. As we all know, and like we keep talking about, the feed rate is the, the number one thing that affects our operation, these furnaces. It not only affects everything, but you guys don't have to worry about keeping within certain feed rate limits because you're not running close to your shell capacities. And one of the other good practices you folks have here, you're taking on the floor cake solids measurements of what at least once a shift to tell you what the quality of the material is coming in to help you find the um, thermal stability of the day. And then my observations are that you folks aren't guilty of panic changing of the feed rate to take care of a process upset that you've had enough experience and sense to know there's a lot easier things to do to deal with an upset rather than changing the feed rate. This is what it looks like inside these furnaces when you don't have feed rate control as this was pretty erratic, affecting both the temperatures and the oxygen level. Same furnace with the feed rate control can be very thermally stable and work very well. Shaft speed effects, I think most of you understand this now. We generally say, you know, I try to remember that slower is lower and faster is higher. And what's going on just for review when we Everything else stays the same and we speed the shaft up. While we're doing, we're increasing the turnover rate and the drying rate in the upper drying zone. Then at the same time, by running at a faster shaft speed, we're slightly increasing the burning rate and a little bit of a heat increase in the heat generation rate. And the combined effect of those two things over 35, 45 minutes, the burn zone will move up. And then conversely, if we slow the shaft speed down, we're going to reduce the turnover rate, the drying rate on top, slows down the burning rate, and those two effects bring it down so that when that sludge comes down here and hits the burn zone like here at Boat Harbor, it says, look, I'm a little bit wetter than the guy you saw 35, 45 minutes ago. It's going to take me a little bit more time and distance to dry and combust. And as we've talked before, we don't we never coach you to use the shaft speed as a quick and dirty fix for controlling the burn zone. If you gotta move the burn zone up and down, you use the burners. The shaft speed's like changing gears. That's a long-term change. And you do have cases where you're not using any burners at all. In that case, you're down to adjusting the shaft speed or the air to take care of the burn zone. But if you're using the burners, use those to um, control where you're burning at. The uh, guy said, well, thank you very much, but what shaft speed for what kind of conditions? Well, in general, we say, well, look, if you have a high feed rate, wet sludges, low solids, if you will, that favors a higher shaft speed. If you have a low feed rate, high cake solids, that favors a slower shaft speed. Well, thank you very much. What, what do you mean higher or lower? Well, we kind of reference around one RPM because if you went around the country, that's where most of the furnaces are running. They're running one RPM and plus or minus depending on feed rate and K quality. So you would have a little bit over one RPM for a, a higher feed rate wetter sludge and a little bit less than one RPM for whatever it is a day. And, and the furnace will train you on this. You get the feel for what fits for your cake solids and feed rate a day because it keeps reporting back to you whether you found the right kind of feed rate or uh, shaft speed range for the cake solids and the cake quality of the day. And like we said, not to use it as a quick and dirty um, fix on adding the burn zone. Air emittance, here you folks have got different arrangements now across your plants. As I understand, Williamsburg, VIP, uh, you're bypassing the heated chaff return air out the main stack for plume suppression, which is a good in use. Chesliz, Army Base, I think Boat Harbor here. 
still able to bring the shaft return air around. It's our number one when we do have that. That's what we want to use as a primary supply for the combustion air source because it's already bought and paid for either by natural gas or volatile solids burning. It's generally like 250 to 300 degrees and bring that around to save fuel. And I think most of you are running with auto oxygen control most of the time, is that correct? And in those cases where we are using the shaft return air, if we needed more, then we would bring in supplemental air through the ambient airports. Draft levels, again, I haven't seen you folks violating this. Everybody's running a pretty low, friendly draft level to reduce the infiltration rate of uncontrolled air. We have seen some facilities run as high as 0 0.5, 0 0.6 inches of water, and that's too high and it causes higher ID fan and power use. We also coach, as you know, that look, if you've got to increase the oxygen level, don't increase the draft to do so. Leave the draft low to minimize air infiltration and open up the area of your dampers to bring more air in. I think you folks do that as well. Again, the burners, we primarily rely upon them to supply whatever supplemental auxiliary heat we need to support the process whatever we're not getting from the sludge itself. Of course, we don't want to overuse them or force fire too hard, let the sludge, let the furnace do some of the work, particularly the drying section. As you know, too, we also say, look, uh, if we can avoid it, let's not use the burners on the burn zone hearth. You know, it's like putting a blowtorch on a campfire. Use the burners below the burn zone or above the burn zone. It makes it a little friendly and we avoid those hot spots you can get inside with a 2,000 degree burner flame intersecting the sludge burning can cause clanker and slagging. And we do see some slagging in facilities where they're overusing the burners on a given hearth. Instrumentation, again, we particularly look at all the time at the feed rate. We don't know what that is all the time, the oxygen level and also particularly the Temperature trends on the hearth to tell us whether the furnace is thermally stable or not. We still have a hydrocarbon analyzer around, and it does indicate at times whether we got some transitions going on inside the furnace and gives us some idea of how things are going. It doesn't tell the whole story, but it has its uh, usefulness as well. Since we look at the temperatures a lot, here's an example from Hartford, Connecticut, where 250 degrees difference even with thermocouples around the circumference depending on what's going on. You might have seen that as well. Then again, back to this old fussing I've been saying out loud about the being regulated to a minimum combustion zone temperature. The rule doesn't respect the fact that these thermocouples are only measuring a surrogate temperature at the wall. It can be a lot hotter inside and like um, you guys have probably seen you run this performance test. If you get caught like at Boat Harbor or BIP on the outside of Hearth 4 out on the edge because you're running a higher feed rate, you record a higher exit, higher wall temperature. Okay, and then everybody goes home. You come in the next day, feed rate's lower. Nice sludge burning on the inside near the shaft. The thermocouple says, where you at? You're only 12, 15 out here. You artificially had to fire burners to maintain this burn zone temperature. I'm sorry, this is not a good rule. Hopefully down the road we can get EPA to re reconsider it because that's even environmentally not as friendly as doing what we're doing. But anyway, that's where you, I don't know what you guys have been running into, but I know that's happened elsewhere. We promised earlier to show you a heat release rated limited furnace. This furnace is running 32,000 wet pounds an hour. Dry sludge, about 8,000 dry pounds. All the body burners are off. All the heated shaft return air is being bypassed out to the roof. Using nothing but cold air, it's coming out at 1210, the after burner section and so on. And here we're recording 1910 and 1880 on the thermocouples at the wall. What was going on there? On the hearth where it was recording 1910, 
The hearth is totally dark. The sludge is steaming, still drying. There is no flame. But it says it's 1910. And of course, it's the hot gas coming down from where the sludge was burning down here inside of hearth five and six and coming out through the top. And again, that's another physical reality that the rule does not consider. And in fairness to the rule writers, they weren't source familiar. And as I understand, they visited some of your facilities when they were writing this rule to see what these furnaces look like. So there's a lot of aspects of this new regulation that need to be reviewed and reconsidered later. And in fairness to them, they got caught in a legal time squeeze of doing, writing these rules, whereas before, back in the 80s, when they passed the subpart O rule, they took time to do tests, talk to the industry. Likewise, with the 503 rules, they did testing. We had a chance to talk with them directly, and we made the rule reasonable and uh, familiar with the facilities themselves. That didn't happen this time. And I think this has been uh, the first time that NACLA has sued EPA over a rule. So we say what our best operating instrument is, is looking inside as we talked about so you don't get surprised with these new computerized displays and all that. You can get stuck to the chair. But I think any experienced operator can tell you. And I always say, I'll raise my hand, I'm the laziest operator in the room. I'm going to go out and take a look because I might think I got a problem based on what I'm seeing in temperatures and all that on the screens. But I go out there and it's okay or I got a problem. So we always coach that, don't make any major process change without looking inside because that's your best information in spite of all the good information we're now getting from the modern, modern monitoring systems. Here's an example where this facility, they did not look into the furnace for six months. The reason was the hearth doors did not have the little slide gates, peepholes. All they had was the uh, some site tubes, and they got carbon over. The second thing that was going on, they had qualified, this was an 11 hearth 22.3 furnace, and it's rated for 2.5 dry tons an hour thereabouts. They had qualified it at three dry tons an hour and been running it at three dry tons an hour over their limit for the six months. Then in addition to that, the burner firing on the primary hearth was all by automatic control. The operator was not turning the burners on and off. The computer was based on temperature limits that they set. And the computer would turn them on sequentially and go around based on what the, and back and forth. So after six months, this is what it was. And it was about a 14 inch hard slag bed and three or four of the uh, teeth were thermally deformed inside because being that hot and as it grew up, it thermally deformed them. So, this is probably the worst case of not looking inside and overfeeding a furnace. And if you went around the country and looked at different facilities, you generally find two categories of operation, what we call kind of the blast furnace sort of operation, too many burners, force firing, all the rest. And then you have other facilities that are letting the furnace drying section do the work, bring it down as cool as you can and then let it take off course the new rules are complicating that to some extent. This is an example looking into the, from a hearth four on an even hearth furnace into the inner ring of hearth three. This is slag buildup on the center shaft. It was rubbing in three and sparking in three places and when they shut it off it froze. And this shows what can happen over time when you're firing burners in the burn zone. The hot burner flame catching the ash and smacking it against the shaft or the arms and it, you're plastering it. So we talk about taking the work out of running the furnaces. As you guys know, when we can walk into any of your furnaces here in the district or any furnace in the country and we can calm it down. Sometimes it might take a few changes, but we can get it thermally stable by first looking inside, find out where it's burning, number one. But that doesn't tell us whether it's thermally stable or not. The next best information is the temperature trend chart to tell us whether the furnace is thermally stable or it's on the move either up or down. Of course, we'd also look at the 
oxygen trace and the feed rate history. You would be taken on the floor cake solids measurement. That generally happens at the beginning of your shift. Is that right? So you find out what the cake quality is. Is the shaft speed of the day, you know, if it's not stable and it's on the move, is the shaft speed setting appropriate for the feed rate you're running and the cake quality of solids of the day? So if I set the, the feed and I don't change that and I get the shaft speed where it needs to be and the furnace generally trains you by experience about what fits for the cake solids and the feed rate you're burning, I set those two things and I'm not going to change those and the draft is fixed to control the air movement rate those three things affect 90% of what's going on inside the furnace. Now you're down to adjusting burners, as you know, or air emittance to thermally stabilize the furnace. And eventually, you're going to thermally stabilize it. Whether you find it there or you're not, you can always get it done. Here was some reference on the shaft speeds with respect to the cake solids. And then, like we said, we're down to just a dust and burn because with you're not changing the big stuff that's affecting what's going on, what minor changes you make on your burner use profile or your air emittance practice, you can see whether you're making the patient better or worse, so to speak. So we talk again here, just to repeat, take time to look inside before making any change. I don't think any of you use airflow to control furnace temperatures. Sometimes, maybe when it gets hot over in Williamsburg. Minimize the use of burners, of course, where possible. You run everything in auto, the fan, the med draft control, the burners, the air. As we talk about not using the shaft speed as a quick and dirty fix. Try not to get married to specific heart temperatures, although now we have to put an asterisk on that because the new rule says you've got to maintain a minimum combustion zone temperature. Uh, we talk about not a try to avoid emitting air directly in the burn zone because doing so will have, we think, helps create more NOx, form more NOx and visible yellow. And <clears throat> like you wouldn't put a leaf blower on a campfire, we'd say, look, don't, why do it in the furnace? It's pretty warm and toasty in there. Put it below the fire or above the fire, and preferably below the fire, as you all know, works best. And we talk about letting the sludge do the work. Here again, the same furnace we talked about before. Notice how cool the drying hearth temperatures are. Here's another example of 12 hearth furnace in Buffalo. One, two, three, four, five. Five drying hearths all below 1,200 degrees. The sludge is 19% solids and puny 55% volatiles. Same furnace with a new centrifuge getting 26% solids. One, two, three, still pretty cool, and off it went. You guys have seen all this before. Here's another example from uh, Columbus, uh, Ohio. Again, very cool temperatures, steady conditions. So we talk about an example here in this modern display screen where we show everything we need to know for a furnace operation out of ovation. Temperature trends, feed rate, oxygen level. When we're running, we should be looking at all three of those all the time. Any change in any of them, we got work to do. But once we've looked inside, we know where it's at, and these don't change, life is good, and as we jokingly say, we can catch up on other things. So we talk about, as we joked about, building a campfire and getting the job done. I want to review briefly these get out of trouble procedures. Let me briefly talk here. I think most of you have been through the drill, but for the record, the new operators looking at this a year from now. You can have a rising fire high temperature condition, which is indicating that for whatever's going on in your feed rate and cake solids, the burner use rate, the heat input is more than what you need for the cake feed and quality you got. These things, kind of conditions happen when you might have a feed rate interruption or the cake dries up and all of a sudden the heat energy uh, burner use pattern is more than what you need. We've all been through this. Conversely, a dropping fire, low temperature condition, feed rate is increased on you, cake solids have wetted up, and now the burner use amount is not enough to keep the burn zone where it is and it starts dropping on you. 
little detailed discussion here with respect to the new rules on opacity and uh, taking a furnace out of service. You can't have an opacity condition occur while you're running. If again you have a little drop in the feed rate, burner firing, oxygen chews down. Opacity occurs when we don't have enough oxygen in the furnace. We got unburned, incomplete combustion. So the thing we want to do is restore the oxygen level first. So the two best, most direct things to do that is cutting off the burners or reducing their firing rate and slowing down the shaft speed. When we slow down the shaft speed, we're slowing down the burning rate and slowing down the oxygen demand. And generally taking those two things will take care of an opacity up. So if it gets real ugly and it's real bad, then we can stop the shaft, pay attention to the oxygen level as that recovers, restart the shaft, and do the shaft center shaft bumping to recover things and avoid a visible emission violation. Taking the furnace out of service now, I've seen here in the district, there's two approaches to this. One approach says, well, gee, uh, even with the new rules, I want to get this over with. So they'll speed the shaft up to make the burnout happen quicker. The cold get off a of permit. Well, if you can get by with that and not have an opacity episode, that's fine. I'm a little cowardly about that, that a lot of times you can get surprised and having an opacity episode is a reportable event or if somebody's coming by, you can get a phone call. In the case of larger furnaces that are out there running 15,000, 30,000 watt pounds, you can't even consider doing that. But some of them even have opacity meters on because if you tried to run it real fast, you would have a smoking episode that would go on for a long, long time. So what we have generally have recommended either small furnaces or big furnaces. First, you say, okay, I've shut the feed off. Now, we used to baby step into this. We'd wait and say, okay, let's, let's wait till the temperatures start increasing, then we'll cut the burners off. Well, we don't do that anymore. We said, look, the furnace is very hot. You can always turn the burners back on. So we'd say, hey, once I've shut the feed off, you know you're not gonna have any more feed. You're gonna have this come at you anyway. Go ahead and shut all the burners off. You can always turn them back on make that oxygen available and get the heat out of it. Speed the shaft up at least one RPM to try to clear the material off the top hearth and get it down, 10 or 15 minutes. After that period of time, then slow the shaft speed down as low as you can take it for your given interlock, 0.4, 0.3 RPM, whatever you can do. And then at that point, what we're watching now is we want to, we used to worry about the peak temperature Look, these furnaces can handle a peak temperature even over 2,000 degrees for a little while. Forget about the peak temperature. Watch the oxygen level because that's telling you what's going on with the opacity. So you want to keep that above at least 3% or more along the way and not worry about the temperature because what you're doing is going to minimize the peak temperature anyway. And like we say, look, the high temperature is inside the house, but if I don't pay attention to that oxygen, I'm going to have an opacity so, and that's outside the house and your public is visible. And most of your plants are in pretty visible locations, particularly here at Boat Harbor and VIP. So that's what we coach and you'll find in practice that'll particularly slowing the shaft speed down will help you minimize the peak temperature and also enable you to keep the oxygen at a level that you avoid an opacity episode. Let me stop there. Any questions? I'm not sure what all of you have been practicing. I think you generally follow that pretty much that kind of script, don't you? It's going to take a little bit longer to burn out, but uh, trying too fast it takes the risk of having an episode.